take care next time you're exploring the waters around Australia because hidden in the sand or mud could be a stingray. And while they aren't aggressive in themselves, if you accidentally step on one, they will protect themselves with a very sharp barb that can cause serious injury. It's well below the waves that you're likely to encounter a stingray. They're bottom dwellers, with most stings occurring when people accidentally step on them, as marine biologist Grant Willis explains. Rays are all quite closely related to the sharks. They're called elasmobranchs, so rather than having a bony skeleton, they've got cartilage. The easiest way for the average person going for a snorkel to tell the difference between a shark and a ray, everyone knows yeah, the classic shape of a shark. But the best way to tell is sharks have the gills on the side of their head and rays have their gills underneath their body. This is an estuary ray, so they're really common in the estuaries where the river meets the sea, so in shallow waters, mud flats and things. They've got that big long whip-like tail. Halfway along that tail they've got their stinging barb and that's what they use to defend themselves. That size ray, that's the size of the barb that it would have. Pretty tough material, lots of barbs on it. These things go in well and then when they come out it's when they do a lot of the damage. One expert who's treated plenty of stingray wounds is Dr Carl Edmonds. I've been a diving physician now for some 40 odd years. Because of that I end up seeing a lot of marine animal injuries from non-divers as well. John Pierce has felt the full pain of a stingray barb. We were just coming in from a big yacht, finished lunch, we uh, went back out to the dinghy to get onto the yacht and I was just walking in the water up to about uh, my knees and I was about one foot away from the, the dinghy and then um, I tried on a stingray. So when you tread on the ray, it's an automatic reflex. The tail comes up and the, this barb goes out and it goes forward and therefore it tends to penetrate the ankle. And I lift my foot up, it was just gushing out with blood everywhere. Like an artery had been uh, severed or something like that, it was that bad. The barb goes into the tissue and sends out a venom which is extremely painful. Uh, so that initially the symptoms are due to the venom or the toxin in the stingray spine. It was like somebody getting a pen and ramming it into your foot. That's what it felt like. The pain was just immense. For the first you know, day or so, that's your problem, it's the venom. That's what's going to do all the damage and that can actually kill you. Well, we did all the wrong things, of course. Uh, you know, you see blood and things, you try to stop it with ice. The wound is extremely painful, it starts getting swollen, very hard to touch, to move. And, and so the first thing to do really is to put the wound into fairly hot water, about 45 degrees centigrade. Let all the toxins come out. In fact, I've put all the toxins back into my system. And I started to shiver a bit and things like that. And uh, I had a glass of wine to you know, try and get over everything. I did ring my sister that night when it happened. She said go straight to hospital, but I didn't listen to her. Commonly, there's a foreign body effect because a little bit of the stingray spine or the skin over the spine has been left in the wound. And that's a foreign body effect, so that tends to, to start showing up a week or two after the injury. I went to a medical clinic and then uh, they had a look at it. By that time it was numb and I could feel around in the area. It was like, like a little V that it put onto my, my foot. The wound may look as though it's closed over and then it starts breaking open again. It was given some antibiotics. That was okay for about a week. The day after I stopped taking the antibiotics, um, it got worse. So I went back to a, another doctor and told him what had happened. He gave me more antibiotics. They're usually treated by the general practitioners most of whom have had no training in treatment. I went to and see another doctor and just more antibiotics and it just kept getting bigger and bigger. There'll be a lot of dead tissue under that because the, the, the venom destroys tissue. So that's all got to be removed. Then I went to Fiji and uh, saw a Fijian doctor and he suggested uh, I get the area debribed. Debribing is like cutting the whole thing out, replacing it with your own skin, a skin graft. And once you've removed that, there is unlikely to be any further um, long-term effects. But if you don't debride that or don't clean it, then you could be in big trouble. But because I had the infections, the Staphylococcus and the Mycobacterium marinum, the first skin graft that they took didn't take, so I had to um, have a second operation. So I was in the hospital in total for 20 days. When you think of all the stingrays around that coastline, uh, you're an awful lot of stings. 
In Australia, the deaths are essentially where the barb has actually penetrated the, the cavities, like the heart cavity or the lung cavity or the abdominal cavity. And one of the few recorded deaths that I've ever heard of was a kid on a boat. They pulled one of those big guys up and the little poor little kid was in the way and it copped the, the spine right through his chest. They didn't realise that the ray had gone in as far as it had. The, the spine had gone in and then uh, about four or five days later when the wound necrosed, it just, you know, gets, the skin dies. He hemorrhaged and died that way. So this is a classic uh, area here, like where a stingray would have been. You can still make out the outline here, and the tail section there. Once the tide goes out, it would have taken off. There's a distinctive shape though. There's another one just here. We're all over the place. I only know of five deaths in Australia, but you know, how does one, you know, no one, no one records these things, so there could be any number. Wading in water like this or walking through water like this is not too bad, but I wouldn't be going out there any further with uh, past my knees, no way in the world. Lots of different types of stingrays in Australia. This big guy here is a smooth ray. That's the biggest stingray we've got in Australian waters. These things can get up to 350 kilos. That's, that's a pretty massive animal. Two and a bit metres across the wingspan and over four metres long from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. You can imagine messing with this guy. He's got the power and the size and they do have the sting on the tail and they are very capable of defending themselves if need be. They are absolutely not aggressive animals. You know, they'll only sting you if you stand on them. Well, you, know, you don't want to be stood on. You wouldn't like that either. The waters of northwestern Australia hide many secrets. For swimmers, it's a place of refuge from the sticky tropical heat. For professional divers, there's a rich bounty below the waves. The glorious White Pearl. But for both divers and swimmers alike, there lurks in these waters something surprisingly venomous. Any month of the year, but particularly between November and June, Australia's most northerly waters attract a deadly creature. Now this is the Irrigangi jellyfish, an extremely small body but very long tentacles which are covered with stingers that can be potentially lethal. Such is the problem, officials at Broome have ordered that their popular cable beach be netted for Irrigangi jellyfish. Our main uh, season is in the wet season. Jason O'Donnell is the first lifesaver in Australia to sweep the beach for Irukandjis. In conjunction with Surf Life Saving Queensland, James Cook University in Queensland and the Broomshire Council, we're sampling the water twice a day to collect data for researchers in Queensland and also helps us determine a time of year when the sting is more prevalent. It is a sampling method, so it's, it's a huge sea out there and it's sometimes like finding a, a needle in a haystack. So if we find a lot of them in, the, in our sample, we'll go out and do another sample in case we do find, and then if we do find near Ganji, we then close the beach. And the two following days after that, we put more warning signs out. That allows us to hopefully prevent someone from getting stung, and that, that's really the name of the game, to be uh, proactive about it. Those sweeps were started after surfer Mark Longhurst had a very nasty encounter. A bit of a cyclone brewing off the coast, had a big swell crew, so managed to get off early from work and shoot down for a quick surf. And um, there's probably about 60 people out making the most of it. And been out in the water for about 15 minutes, enjoying a well-earned surf. When all of a sudden a jellyfish went up the back of my board shorts and stung me on the right thigh. Researching the Irukandjis is Dr Phil Aldersley. The sting is quite mild, so the people didn't even realise that they'd been stung by a jellyfish at that stage. The patient brushes up against one of these things, gets a cursory sting. Only a minute amount of venom is injected because the animal is so small, but that's enough to cause very serious problems in the patient. I originally thought it must have been a big box jellyfish by the severity of the sting. Couldn't see any big whip marks, typical of the big boxies. So breathed a sigh of relief and thought, well, it's not a box jellyfish. Can't be an Irigangi because I've never heard of Irigangis hurting so much when they sting. Possibly some of the severity of the toxicity of the sting was the fact that the jellyfish was caught under the board shorts and just sitting there and envenomating for about 15 minutes. Stings can occur from the tentacles, but also from on the bell of the jellyfish as well. The bell has little tiny dots on it. If you put those under a microscope, you can see they're actually made up of many, many stinging cells. So you have a, one type of stinging cell on there and different types that are in the tentacles. Now, the Irukandji 
name comes from a tribe of Aboriginal people that lived in the Palm Cove area north of Cairns. When the first jellyfish, this species here, was found that caused this syndrome, it picked up the name Irukandji. But we now know the number of different box jellyfish and other jellyfish which can cause this syndrome, and they all tend to pick up the name Irukandji. There's two types of Irukandji stingers in there. One's a really small one, which is the uh Krikoro Barnes eye after Dr. Barnes. The other one, we're still trying to work out if, if it gives the Irigangi syndrome. It's down at Toxology Lob in Melbourne at the moment, but we're pretty sure it does. Dr. Barnes he actually found the animal and tested it on himself and his son to see whether, whether the animals they found were actually the culprits. He said that he'd prefer to get stung by Chironex, which is the big box jellyfish known for many, many fatalities, rather than the trauma that he went through being stung by this little fellow. About 10 minutes after the sting, I started getting really tight in my chest, so I paddled back into the beach with um, difficulty to breathe. And that was about when I realised that, gee, something's going on here. People have thought that they've had the bends, people have thought they've been having gastric traumas. And then uh, this pain starts to spread into the abdomen. And when I got to the beach and tried to stand up, I had excruciating pain through my lower back and my neck, and found it hard to walk, doubling up with pain. Felt my, like my chest was just caving in. This is just accompanied by things like a massive headache, uh, a huge feeling of, of doom that the end of the world is nigh. Um, nausea, tremor, racing heart, extremely high blood pressure. By the time I got to the top of the stairs, I was screaming in agony. I was gasping for breath, and it was a battle between having the energy to scream in agony and actually take a breath. Um, to keep going. Uh, I kept going and made it to my car, tried to pick up a mobile phone to phone somebody and couldn't coordinate any of my body to dial the numbers. Thankfully, um, a young guy came up to see if I was OK and explained to him that I'd been stung, which by this time with the symptoms that were coming on, I expected was an irrigandy. So he drove me to the hospital, which was about a 15 minute drive. And the whole time I was in the car driving to the hospital, I was envisaging lying in the back of the car, suffocating, not breathing, and nobody knowing that I'm suffocating and not being able to do anything about it. The driver trying to get to the hospital as quick as he could. You have to put people into intensive care and, um, and inject them with um, strong opiates to try and cure them. Because my blood pressure was so high, they administered morphine immediately uh, with no effect, and they kept administering morphine to try and get some relief from the pain, and um, by the time I drank the hospital dry of morphine, it still had no effect. So that there is a relatively new treatment being tried now, which is an infusion of magnesium sulfate, which is like, so it seems to be fixing a lot of the problems. And with the amount of drugs that they put into me over the course of a number of hours, um, they eventually had to induce me into a coma to, um, to keep all my systems working because of the amount of drugs that my body was taking to, with very little effect to the symptoms of the sting. The Royal Flying Doctor flew me to Perth, admitted to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital into the intensive care, um, still on life support, and I was un unconscious for two to three days. Once I came conscious, um, I was in hospital for another three days um, before I managed to convince the doctor to discharge me, and then I stayed in Fremantle for another week, working up the energy to walk and get mobile enough to fly back to Broome. It's something that I've been exposed to for quite a while, being involved in the pearling industry, and our, our pearl divers get stung every season by your Ganges. Brought a bloke over from our sister ship there one day and he was convulsing in pain, actually rising off the deck of the boat and actually sort of throwing himself into the gunnel and uh, laying back down again. We brought him onto the deck of the mother ship and uh, sort of showered him up and about uh, 30 milligrams of morphine later, he was uh, laying comfortably in his bunk. But uh, the actual traumatic of the ordeal was uh, quite horrendous to watch there, actually, and uh, it's sort of not hard to see why these guys actually get a feeling of impending doom. Since being stung, I've learned a lot more about them. They're an amazing creature. They're not like the typical jellyfish that I always envisage is just drifting around the ocean with the currents and if you're unlucky enough to bump into one, well, so be it. These things have got four eyes, 360 degree vision. They come in with a, a rising tide into the shallows and then they hunt in the falling tide in the shallows and they can actually see their prey and hunt it a bit like a trawler would. When I swim in the areas that we're at high risk from them, I wear a full length stinger suit now. Full range stinger suit will cover 
majority of your body, so you're going to reduce the risk of about 80%. These are just uh, little booties that I wear, and I also wear some gloves of uh, similar material because that's going to protect more of my body as well. The treatment for these is vinegar, and lots of it when you first get stung. What the vinegar does, it doesn't relieve any pain, but it neutralises the stinging cell from re-stinging you. I didn't bring any vinegar to the beach with me. Um, possibly if I had got out of the water as soon as I got stung and applied vinegar to the site, the severity of the sting may not have been as bad as what it was. Don't rub sand on them. That's very important. The old uh, sand is definitely not the go. Just vinegar and more vinegar and lots more vinegar. Despite the fact I've had 15 wet seasons in Broome and I know the dangers of box jellyfish here and that you really should swim with stinger suits or not swim at all, but I didn't take any of those precautions, so I took the risk and um, had the unlucky incidents of running into one.